All right, officially, good morning. Your, your two minutes of, of rushing to your emails is, has ended officially, so it is 11 o'clock. We will get rolling. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? This will be more of a crowd participation energy. Obviously, if you talk about emotion, you can't get up here and be blasé. So I'm gonna need uh, some participation. I'm gonna ask some questions so there'll be some fun things in here. Uh, I am Rich Bracken from Sins and Leonard Street. I'm a business development manager and uh, based in Kansas City. And today, I am going to arm you with nothing about charts, nothing about ROI, nothing about anything, but what I'm going to do is I'm gonna give you the most effective tool that you could possibly have in your personal and professional life, and that is emotional intelligence. And it's a, a key buzzword that floats around in the industry quite a bit, so we're gonna talk about a bunch of different things, um, but really what I wanna do is arm you with the tools and the necessary uh, awareness of your own emotions and how you can communicate more effectively. Now, this is the most fantastic slide you'll see all week. A pitch black screen of nothingness, right? Um, so I wanna paint a picture for you. So you're starting your morning, you're on your way into work, you're taking the train, you're driving in. It's a good day, it looks like this outside, it's perfect, it feels like San Diego no matter what city you're in. It is perfect, the morning has started perfect, your coffee was perfect, your breakfast was perfect, everything is fantastic. You're driving into work, right? All of a sudden, you notice something in the left-hand lane. It's that person that doesn't understand that the left-hand lane is for what? Passing. And what are they doing? They're swerving, because what are they doing in the lane? They're texting and driving, right? So your perfect morning has turned to this. This is mentally how you feel. You want to scream at the person. You want to make them move. You probably say a few things that you probably wouldn't normally say in front of children. You're upset. You've been disrupted. Then you get into work. What is the first thing that we do when we get into work? Check our emails, right? Check our inbox, check our voicemail. Find out what we have to do that day. Look at our calendar. What is the first thing you see at the top of the box? Urgent, last minute, need this today, request. And what do you wanna do? You wanna to punch today in the face because you have now allowed outside influences to affect your emotions. You have let those outside things control how you feel. You went from controlling your own to letting the influences take over your day. And then at the end of the day, you feel like this, because you've spent all day long battling deadlines, battling communication, working with difficult personalities. Everything that goes into your day gets you to a point where you want to just curl up in a blanket and you have this face on, preferably with a nice bottle of wine, right? Because you are spent, you are exhausted, you don't want to have anything to do with anything when you get home. But life is life, right? So you're going to have things to deal with when you get home. Maybe you have a week like this with your team. Everything seems to be coming at you at once. Multiple angles, multiple people, multiple projects, multiple everything. You want to go on an anarchy spree to say no more RFPs, no more AFAs, no more chambers, no more benchmark litigation. We're not doing any of this, right? You wanna revolt, you wanna be done with it, you wanna say we're done, we're sick of it, like all these things are done. By the way, if you're gonna throw a bottle of wine, <laughs> make sure that thing is empty because that will literally infuriate me and anybody else. So my emotional intelligence trigger is this, don't throw a full bottle of wine. <laughs> Maybe you feel like this. Have you ever been in a meeting where you're just kind of there, you're checked out, not really, you're, you're, you're listening but you're not hearing anything, right? If you don't see anybody else in your, in your meeting looking like this, chances are you are. Because there's usually one person in a meeting that feels and looks like this. You're checked out. But again, a lot of the times, you're not really understanding where these emotional fluxes come from. And so today we're gonna talk about that because there's a staggering statistic. 36% of Americans can identify and process their emotions. Only 36%. Anybody do any quick math? How many people don't have control of their emotions? Vast majority, right? So we're gonna talk about a few things today that are gonna to help you understand, one, how to identify those emotions, and two, 
how to control them within yourself, and then also how to react to other people. So I've got a few takeaways. Um, if you want to take, I've got some fantastic pictures. I'm going to go ahead and brag on myself here. I've got some really great images up here. So if you want to take some pictures, post some genius bullet points that I'm going to have up here. If you want to post them on Twitter or LinkedIn and hashtag LMAP3, um, my handle there, Rich Bracken one if you want to add, uh, add me on Twitter and put that on there as well. So some of the key takeaways. What is emotional intelligence? It is not the fact that you watch every episode of This Is Us. Emotional intelligence is going to be defined, broken down. We're going to talk about the different components of emotional intelligence. You're going to learn what the daily benefits of emotional intelligence can be for you, both personally and professionally. And finally, what's in it for me, right? You're not going to sit in here and listen to a bunch of stuff that you may or may not use later on. You want to have applicable things that are going to help you in your career. So I'm going to give you some tips and tricks on how a high EQ not only can you improve your EQ, but how it's going to actually benefit your career. So who in here, by a show of hands, is either in the top position in their department or aspires to be that, play, that person? Show of hands. For those of you that don't want to be the top person in your department, we'll talk about career choices later on. <laughs> uh, but everybody wants, we aspire. We get into a career path because we want to be a leader. We want to be somebody who has influence. We want to be able to work with teams and influence people and, and help people grow their own careers, right? And for a long time, intelligence was enough. You could be smart, you could work your way up the ladder, you could be smart and get past everything that you need to get past, but that's not enough anymore. So IQ is very important. There's a room full of smart people. I'm probably the lowest common denominator here because you're all the smart people. I'm just the guy with the pocket square. But I want to talk to you about the things that are now really required of effective leadership. Things that are, that are playing into, one, whether or not you get promoted, Two, how you're compensated. And three, how effective you are. So these are the top four soft skills that have been recognized for effective leaders. I see some jotting down if you want to take pictures too. This is, this is a good one. Um, leadership is obviously going to be number one. I think it's just a good peanut butter thing that's going to always be top of the list. You need to be a good leader to be in a leadership role, right? Pretty, pretty easy to figure out. But number two is emotional intelligence. So the fact that emotional intelligence has gone from a little known fact, a little bit of a buzzword, keyword, to now the number two thing that are, is looked at in potential leaders in an organization says something about the research, the proof points, the things that have been discovered through emotional intelligence that make them very, very um, relevant and important topics that you need to be working on as an individual. Um, obviously, teamwork and influence uh, will play into that, and I'll talk a little bit about how teamwork and influence are affected by emotional intelligence as well. So, emotional intelligence. Uh, there are several different schools of thought on emotional intelligence. I did bring up a long copy. Um, this is Dr. Travis Bradbury and Gene Greaves, Emotional Intelligence 2.0. Find it anywhere, you find books. Um, Amazon, which literally is taking over the world. Uh, has it. They've got all kinds of great tools. There's another book that, that complements that called Leadership 2.0. Phenomenal book. Great book. It also has a test that you can take online to find out what your emotional intelligence score is. Um, I'm proud to say that I ranked pretty high. I have, some, I have some areas of improvement, but humility is part of emotional intelligence. So. <laughs> So Travis breaks it down. I'm on a first name basis with a guy I've never met, right? Travis breaks it down into two different big buckets, personal competence and social competence. Personal competence, obviously, the things that you control, things that you have to do with. Self-awareness and self-management. And we'll break all of these different components down here in a little bit. But the other bucket is social competence. Because how many times have we met somebody that's maybe not the best relationship communication kind of person? Maybe they're really smart. Maybe they get a lot of things. but I'll be damned if I'm going to put a conversation together with them because they can't talk correctly. They can't communicate correctly. They can't contain their emotions. Or maybe you have a little bit of a hard time reading their emotions. Maybe they're passive aggressive. Um, I won't make fun of maybe one of my teammates in here from Minnesota, but there's a term called Minnesota nice. It's very passive aggressive, right? And I adore him or her, so I'm not going to make fun of them. But my wife is also from Minnesota, so I'll make fun of her because she's not here. Uh, but Minnesota nice is a real term, so it's really that passive-aggressive communication. So within the social competency section, you talk about social awareness, which is really just kind of being aware of what's around you, who's communicating with you, and, and different components there. And then also relationship management, which is really the first three combined into one. So if you look at these as, as kind of a, a, 
a progression of where you need to be focusing your work, your self-awareness to your self-management, to your social awareness, to your relationship management. Relationship management is kind of the peak. That's where you want to be. You want to be optimal in your relationship management. So let's break these down. Self-awareness. People that have a high EQ, and all of these are going to be relative to high EQ individuals, traits and, and qualities that these people possess. So being in tune with your emotions, right? So that may seem really easy to say, like, oh, I'm, I'm very in tune with my emotions. I'm an adult. I get it, right? But maybe there are things that you get angry about. But it's not about the actual thing that you're getting angry about. Maybe it's somebody that you don't want to deal with, that they, they're your trigger. Think about somebody that, and, and my teammates probably will raise their hand and point at me, but think of somebody at work that maybe sets you off a little bit, that maybe you, it raises your angst a little bit, right? We all have those individuals. So is it actually that person, or is it maybe something that is underlying? Maybe they talked to you a certain way that reminded you of something else. And I'm not gonna get too deep and psychological on you, but there are some people that you can think of that they're a trigger to you because they talk to you like your father did or like a high school bully did. Those are the things that you need to be aware of. So being in tune with your moods, your feelings and emotions, and then people that have a high IQ are very aware of how their emotions affect their behavior. Because you can have your own emotions, but it's what you're doing with them that is really key. Because you can think and feel all you want, but once you engage in a conversation, that's when your emotions come out. That's when your emotions get the best of you in certain situations. That's when you maybe don't communicate as effectively as possible. You know, if, if you're thinking about that person in the left-hand lane, if I had a conversation with that person, probably wouldn't be my best day, wouldn't be my best conversation. So I need to understand why my emotions or how my emotions affect my communication and my behavior. Uh, the impact of feelings on outward displays. So reverse those. Um, so the outward, uh, outward displays and behaviors, but then also the thoughts and decisions. Think about a time that you made an emotional purchase, right? You bought it because it was sentimental. You, you did something or you made a decision because you were basing it off emotion. Or you were angry and you went and did something or you said something. That behavior has been triggered by the emotion that you didn't quite see coming. You didn't quite have a good idea of what it was going to do and how you were going to be able to corral it. Think about... Take a, take a Sprite bottle, right? Take a closed Sprite bottle. If you shook that bottle up, what happens? Anyone? Right, but what do you see before it explodes? Right. That's where you have to be aware of your emotions. Your emotions are those bubbles that start rising to the top, and that's the thing where you run to the sink, right? Because you don't want to get Sprite or whatever all over the place. You run to the sink because you know it's coming. Being aware of your emotions are the recognition of those bubbles that are coming to the top before it explodes, so you can contain them a lot better. Self-management. So step one, identify your emotions. Be more in tune with your emotions. Um, for the fellows in here, I know that that's something that we, that we don't really talk about a whole lot, but trust me, it's incredibly valuable. It makes you okay with buying pink socks. You know, it happens to the best of us. Now self-management is really how you control yourself with those emotions. Being able to manage and, and effectively manage your emotions is key. Again, we're all emotional people, we're all emotional beings, but if you let those emotions get the best of you, you could put yourself in some bad situations. You could have some awkward conversations, you could say things that you would like to take back, or maybe you just don't communicate effectively. So being able to manage your emotions is, is really, really key. Moving on quickly from adverse events. How many times have we had something, kind of like I talked about earlier, something that just completely threw a dagger in our day? You had your day planned out, you had all these things you're going to get done, and then something happened, and all of a sudden, your day blew up. What does that do to you, right? That sets everything in a different path, because you came into the day understanding what you wanted to get done, understanding that you were going to control the day, and now all of a sudden, what was this is now this. So being able to understand that you can move on from that adverse event, because think about the time that maybe you something happened to you that was negative, or you had a bad experience with something. How long did you hold on to that for? Day, hour, week, month, 10 years, 40 years? Moving on from those events is key, because what good does it do to you? What good does it do to tote that around with you, and how is that going to improve yourself moving forward? 
Implementing strategies to maintain positivity. This is my favorite one. Who here has a positive routine in their day? Like one, one person in the back and then all of a sudden. So, so you have activities that you do that you kind of, you get away from your work or you change your mentality, right? So yoga, meditation, maybe it's music, maybe it's kids, maybe it's uh, working out or whatever, whatever it may be. This is key because no matter what happens in your day, it, people that have a high IQ or EQ will go to these things. So if you think about, you know, here is my, here is my day, my day has gone to shambles, but I have this to go to. I have yoga to go to at five o'clock, so I'm gonna feel much better. Um, I'm, I'm gonna dive into that bottle of wine that I caught that that guy threw, and I'm gonna drink it later on, so that's gonna help me manage my, my emotions, right? But implementing those strategies, implementing a routine. You know, in the morning, I get up at five in the morning, I work out, I do meditation, I have amazing, uh, as a former DJ, I have some amazing playlists on my iPod, and I have a, I have a playlist for every, every mood every single kind of mood. And I know that when I get in my car, I can manage my mood with whatever music playlist I pick. But I know that I have that to set forth my day and I have it on the way back. So if I have a rough day at work, I have a playlist for that. It's very Celine Dion heavy. Uh, <laughs> but it helps me get back in tune. It helps me get back to a good frame of mind. So I highly encourage, if you don't have one, if you don't have a routine, if you don't have a certain set of things that you can do or something that you can go to, please find one. If you need help finding one, you know, hit me up on Twitter or find me on LinkedIn. Absolutely, I'd be more than happy to, to recommend some, some opportunities and some ideas for you based on, based on your comfort level and based on what is, is best for your schedule. And people with a high EQ, how many, how many people have stress in their day? <laughs> All the hands like, yes! So for those, everybody that raised their hand, for those that didn't have the, the positive routine, right, we need to work on that for you. How many people have demands on their day, right? All of us. So those that have a high EQ can manage those things better. So if you think about, think about somebody on your team that is, um, as Stuart Scott from ESPN used to say, cooler than the other side of the pillow, <laughs> right? Somebody who can maintain, somebody who can take on any kind of stressful request or any kind of high pressure demand and just rolls with it. Like they, like they welcome that, psychos, right? <laughs> they want stress, they want those demands in their life, but they can manage it because they understand how to manage their emotions in, the, in those instances. So on the social competence side of things, let's move on to social awareness. This is key because it's one thing to be completely at peace with yourself, understand your emotions, understand how to manage your emotions, but until you are working in a cave by yourself on a mountain and you're making whatever revenue you can because you've made it yourself for yourself, you have to interact with other people, right? We can't all be hermits. If we did, it would be a very awkward country that we lived in. But you have to deal with other people. You have to interact with other people. So being socially aware is a big, big piece of this, especially in team environments and in our, in our companies and firms. I love this because we all think that we're right 99.9% .9 of the time, right? When was the last time you had a disagreement with somebody that you actually took something from their point of view and said, I can see where you think that way, right? You don't always have to agree. I'm not gonna say that you have to agree with everybody. This is not a kumbaya, zen thing. Like, you, you are going to have disagreements. You're not going to see eye to eye with everybody. But if you can at least have the patience and the emotional intelligence to listen and understand somebody else's point of view and see where they're coming from, that will help you in some critical communications. So again, people come to us with rush requirements, right? We, what was the first thing we think? Oh, jerk. Like, you ruined my day because you have a rush requirement. Maybe it was some, a client that they've been waiting on for three years that picked up the phone and said, hey, we're gonna give you your shot. And they came to you in a panic because they needed the best response to that client that they've been working on for three years. But if you're thinking about how it affects your day, you're not taking that into account. So you may not agree, you may not agree that this needs to be done today or in two hours. But if you're not understanding the other person's point of view, you're not seeing the forest for the trees. Listening and observing, which is totally hypocritical and ironic for a, a speaker to say. Make sure you listen, right? I'm up here doing all the talking. But listening and observing. So it's not just listening. Who, who knows somebody who listens to talk, right? They're not listening to what you're saying. You might as well be Charlie Brown's teacher. 
they're listening for the pause. They're listening for the breath. They're listening for you to come up for air. And then, oh, I have something to say, right? You're not listening to what people are saying. So if you listen to listen and not listen to talk, you're going to hear a lot of things that you may not have heard before. And paying attention to the way things are said, how they're said, what intonation, all of those different communication skills are so critical. Because if we're just hearing you know, the wah-wah, you're not going to get the full breadth of how you can engage and relate with that individual. An observation, for those that you work with in person, even on video conferencing, pay attention to body language. Pay attention to what people are saying, especially if it changes in the middle of your communication. If you're telling me, hey, this is a great idea, and I all of a sudden do this, how do I, what do I think of your idea? I don't like how you're delivering it. Not a big fan, or I'm just really cold. But chances are, I don't really buy what you're saying. So if you see this, just take a step back, take a deep breath, re-engage, figure out how that person wants to be talked to, and you'll be a more effective communicator. But observe and listen. In leading interactions, and this isn't leading it for a selfish purpose. You're not taking the conversation and bringing it with you or leading an interaction because of your own self-interest. What this is is engaging everybody that's involved in the conversation or involved in the project. So if you lead an interaction, you make sure that everybody is involved. If, if we take these three ladies right here, if you're leading the conversation and you two are talking and you're leaving her out, that's not an effective lead. You want to make sure, even if this is the quietest person, even if there's somebody on the team that never, ever chimes in, never, ever says anything, never, ever volunteers information, that person is probably the most cognitive. Give them a chance to think. Go to them last. So let them marinate on what they've got to marinate on and then engage them at the end. Even if they say, I don't have an opinion or it doesn't matter to me, at least you've engaged them. But I guarantee you that individual has a point of view. So if you don't engage them there, maybe they don't want to be on a stage. Maybe they don't want to be talking in front of a group. Engage them one-on-one -on -one later on. What would you think of that meeting? Do you have any thoughts on that proposal? What do you think about that pricing structure? I guarantee you everybody, everybody wants to be heard. Everybody. We all have an opinion. We all have a voice. And we all need to be heard. Whether it's in a public forum or a one-on-one -on -one situation, engage those individuals that are least likely to talk and you'll find some gems of information. And then the quant, like the big peak, relationship management. So think about interacting with people. Think about the people that you work with. Think about the top, think about the first 10 people that you work with right now. Could you talk in one style with all 10 of them and be effective? Absolutely not. There's no way. Relationship management, when you optimize this in a high EQ situation, you can shift and move, kind of like Muhammad Ali, right? Float like a butterfly. We'll leave the sting part out because we don't want to sting anybody. But you can move and shift your communication. You can be effective with anybody. You can talk to the most cordial individual, and you can talk to the most analytical, hard to deal with, straight talking individual that you've ever dealt with in the same day, within an hour, if you can shift and move that relationship management piece. The awareness. Awareness piece is critical. Again, it goes back to observation and it goes back to listening. But being aware of what other people think and feel. Again, it doesn't have to be what you think. It doesn't have to be what you feel. But understanding and respecting each individual. Because again, as much as all of us want to be all, all heard, we all want to be respected, right? So it's really that key position of understanding and respecting every position, every thought, every input. When was the last time you disagreed with somebody and said, why do you feel that way? Right? Be aware of who they are and be aware of where their opinion is coming from, because that is so critical, professional and personal. Ask those probing questions. Clear communication. I go back to the Minnesota nice thing. When was the last time somebody told you exactly what they thought, exactly how they felt, exactly what they wanted to the T, which I'm staring at a room full of project managers, so I'm probably going to guess all of you do that very, very effectively. Um, but think about business development people, marketing people, people that maybe leave out a detail or two, maybe are all over the place with ideas, and they don't give you a process map of here's what we need to do next. Right? The guy with the pink socks, that's me. 
I will throw ideas at you all day long. If I don't give you a process map, you may not understand where I'm going with it. So making sure that you're communicating effectively and clearly, making sure that you're laying out expectations, making sure that you're setting deadlines, making sure that you're communicating exactly what you want and exactly how you want it. Because again, think about a time that you've asked somebody to do something, personal, professional. Think about you've, you've asked them to go create this project, create this thing, but you didn't tell them exactly how you wanted it. They brought it back in the most horrific looking PowerPoint slide with graphs that, that my five-year-old could have made. And it doesn't communicate what you wanted to communicate. Did you tell them how you wanted it? Or did you just say, go make this into this however you want, right? So if you're not setting those expectations, you're not communicating clearly, you may miss out on a really good opportunity to connect with that individual and be an effective leader. Finding true value in connections. How many people enjoy meeting other people? I'm not gonna point out the ones that didn't raise their hands. Um, no, I mean, you know, not everybody is that way. Not everybody is, is what we would call a grand socialite, right? They don't, they're not a social butterfly. They don't wanna to meet tons of people. But I guarantee you those people that don't wanna meet a ton of people take true value in the people that they know and the people they engage with. Quality over quantity, right? But understanding that everybody you interact with, everybody in here, let, let's put it this way, everybody in here knows something that you don't. Everybody in here has at least one piece of information that they could share with you that you had no idea existed. There's value in that connection right there. So I encourage you, practice that. Go, go into every interaction as if somebody that you're about to talk to, that you're about to meet for the first time, is going to teach you something is going to share a piece of information with you that you did not know in your 25 plus years. I'll go say 25, because I'm way over 25. But you're gonna teach me something. So that's why I, I enjoy interactions, because I wanna learn from other people. I wanna hear about other people's viewpoints. It shapes how you look at things. We talk about diversity in teams all the time, because why? Everybody has a different viewpoint. Everybody has a different background. Everybody has a different look on things. So if you're not engaging people, if you're not learning from people, if you're not challenging your own thoughts by engaging those other people, you're missing out on a huge opportunity. Who is cool as the other side of the pillow in here? Nobody. Perfect. Awesome. So we're going to work on this part because people with a high EQ, when you get into a relationship status, and this is more just interacting with teammates, interacting with people that you work with, interacting in personal, as far as your friend, your spouse, kids, anytime you have a stressful situation, individuals with a high EQ and they have an optimal hold on their relationship management will be very calm, cool, and collected. Again, think about the last time somebody came to you in a panic. Did you panic too? Because sometimes we mirror and mimic people's behavior. People come to you, I got to have this. Okay, okay, what can I do? If you say, great, let's figure it out. Let's, let's figure this out together. What does that do to the other person? Calms them down. Maybe not to your point, maybe not to the other side of the pillow status that you got, but you bring them down a notch. But if you're panicking right now as much as they are, you're not starting the communication off very well. <laughs> One of my favorite slides, 90%. What do you think this represents? 90% of men cry when you're not looking. It's true. True, 90% of men also cry at the Titanic. It's a very proven fact. 90% of the difference between an average and an outstanding exceptional person, business leader, teammate, 90% of that gap is emotional intelligence. So when you talk about going good to great, going from effective or not effective to effective, 90% of that change is emotional intelligence. But think about the things that we've covered. Your own emotions, feeling them and understanding how to manage them, how to manage other people and how to, how to manage your relationships and also how to engage with other people. If that can't change the scope of your career, the scope of your marriage, the scope of your relationship, the scope of your friendships, it, it, it guaranteed will be because it's something that you, we can all leverage in all of those relationships and all of those communications. So 90% of that gap, so if you think of going from one plateau to another, that gap of, of change is 90% emotional intelligence. So who can tell me one of the lowest emotional intelligence careers 
in the world. We work with them all the time. We spend a lot of time with them. We trust them. They make a lot of money. And they have very low emotional intelligence. Who can tell me what that profession is? Lawyers. Lawyers? Is she right? Doctors. Lawyers are second worst. <laughs> but doctors have some of the lowest emotional intelligence in any industry. And it's shocking, right? Because you go in, you're trusting them with your health and your life. You would think they would know how to interact with you. They would think they would be a little bit empathetic, right? Doctors are not. By nature, they're not. They have, you know, we talk about project management and all the things that we need to do to get to the end, the end answer. Doctors are wired to be if-then in every communication they have. If-then. Okay, tell me your diagnosis. If this, then this, right? So they're, they're wired for this. There is a group called the Joint Commission. I used to work in healthcare IT as well. So this, the Joint Commission, if you imagine an organization that descended upon the legal industry that said, we're going to watch everything you do, and if you don't do it correctly, you are going to be financially penalized, we may shut you down, and we may, you know, and it's not Chambers, Chambers doesn't do that to the law firms, but if you had an organization that could do that, that's what the Joint Commission does to healthcare facilities. They measure the performance improvements they measure the, the quality of care that is given by both the individual hospital and the practitioners within, within it. The Joint Commission came out with a, a release on effectiveness of doctors with emotional intelligence. So they correlated the two. Communication failures cause 70% of serious health outcomes. 70% of serious health outcomes within a hospital facility were caused by low emotional intelligence, right? Doctors interrupted their patients after 18 seconds of communication. 18 seconds. Think about, it, think about a senior citizen. Think about the baby boomers that are now one of the largest health care groups in the country and in history. I love my grandparents, God bless both of them, but they, are not only, they, were, they were old when they passed, but they're from the South. 18 seconds is getting your name out in the South. <laughs> so if you go into a doctor and, you, and they say, well, what's wrong? Well, I kind of... I'm, this is kind of bugging me, and this and this. Think about it. Most of the time you are admitting a health problem, it's an embarrassing situation, right? You don't want to admit that you're sick. You don't want to admit that you're hurt. Think about how many people show up to work sick. Why? Because they don't want to admit they're sick, right? So then they get everybody else sick and it's bedlam. But that 18 seconds could be critical. You could have something that you need to get out that's going to take you a minute. But if you've got your doctor interrupting you saying, yeah, 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 that's fine. This is probably what's wrong with you. How many times have you had that, right? Or if you go on WebMD for 18 seconds, you're probably going to die, right? <laughs> Any symptom you have. Two-thirds, this was shocking, two-thirds of patients leave the hospital without knowing their official diagnosis. Two-thirds. Three people walk out, two people don't know what in the world is wrong with them. That's terrifying because they're not communicated with. They're not listened to. They're not... There's no relationship management there. They're not doing the things that they need to do to effectively communicate with their patients. Imagine, especially as, as expensive as healthcare is, imagine walking into a hospital, spending hours in the hospital, or days in the hospital, coming out with a 50, 60, $70,000 bill, and you kind of don't really know what was really wrong to begin with. Right? Think about a client. Think about one of our clients at a firm. They get a bill. We've not really told them what the problem is. Think they'd be happy? No, absolutely not. Two thirds of patients because of low emotional intelligence. And I won't divulge who was in the room because you all admitted attorneys were the worst. I won't share names for a fee. So some characteristics of people that have the whole package, people that have all the, the social competence, the personal competence, they have high scores on all of these things. I love my little Zen tree there. Admit and learn from mistakes. How many times have you worked for a humble leader? Somebody who was not afraid to either take the blame for the team if a, if a mistake happened, step up and take responsibility, or be humble when something went wrong? Or how many times have you worked for somebody that would throw you under the bus in a heartbeat? Right? The people, <laughs> there were some hands that could have I, I kind of have. Um, but people that, people that have a high emotional intelligence admit and learn from their mistakes. I 
I had a, a segment, I do some work with uh, Fox 4 in Kansas City, and I did a segment on mistakes and failures and learning from things. I never use the word fail, never. Never ever use the word fail, and I encourage you all to do the same thing. Never ever use the word fail. If you don't learn from a mistake, it becomes a failure. If you keep repeating the same thing, it's insanity, right? So everything you do, if you make a mistake, don't ever use the word, I failed. I didn't, you know, that, that is, that, remove that from your vocabulary. If there's one thing that you take away from this, if there's one Twitter post you put up, say, this great presentation taught me to learn to get rid of the word fail, and I'll never use the word again. Because if you start with that mentality, nothing is ever a failure. Everything is a learning process, because everything is gonna provide itself a learning experience for you to get better. Keeping emotions in check. Again, those individuals that we all know, that fly off the handle, right? Those are not high EQ people. Pe people that have a high EQ, have the whole package, understand that even if inside they're that person on the first slide or they're pulling their face to the side, right, with both hands, inside you may feel that way. But your high EQ will allow you to say, okay, great, sure. Which is so dangerous when you're in a relationship. <laughs> when my wife says, no, that's fine, that's fine, yeah, no. Emotions in check, I'm dead. I'm dead. <laughs> listen as much or as like as listen as much or more than you talk. What's the old saying? You're given two ears and one mouth because why? Sunglasses. Trick question. No, you need to listen more than you talk. Again, my, my teammates are rolling their eyes at me because I talk all the time. But I listen very effectively. It's a situation that I wasn't always that way but I learned effective listening techniques. I learned to be able to hear what people were saying. I engaged people when I talked to them and when I listened to them. And so in those communications, I could understand better how to shift my communication. Because again, going back to the whole, if you're listening to talk, you're missing the boat. Listen. Listen to what people are saying and observe what they're saying. Taking criticism well. Who's perfect in here? It's true, she is. She, I know her, she is perfect. She is the one we all aspire to be. But, outside of humility, there is nobody that's perfect. So being able to take criticism and understand that is a room for improvement, not a detriment to who you are. People with a high EQ can, can, can take that and flip it around. Because most people, when they hear something, like I, I went crazy about that, it wasn't the best, you know, I know everybody's gonna give me a perfect rating on my presentation, but if somebody says, wow, that really sucked, okay, why? I wanna know why, because what is that to me? It's a learning experience. I would love to hit 100% perfection that everybody out of here, everybody in this room walks out of this presentation and says, I'm never gonna fail again, and I'm gonna raise my emotional intelligence. And if everybody said that, that to me is a success, 100%. But if one person says, yeah, uh, there weren't any charts, okay, maybe I need to figure out some creative way to, to implement a chart. I don't, it, but it, it really is understanding that criticism is a way to get better. It's not something that you need to go be the dog with the blanket and go crawl up in the corner and say, well, I guess I just suck at presenting. I'm never gonna do it again because that one person totally bagged on me. It's understanding that that is an opportunity to grow. Again, calm under pressure. Think about people, think about the best athletes that people talk about, Jordan, LeBron, yeah, LeBron, he's got a little work to do. But Michael Jordan, I, I'm not a big basketball fan, but I'm a huge Michael Jordan fan. Never saw him get rattled. Why? Because he had great emotional intelligence. He understood that he could overcome. He understood that he could improve his performance and overcome any deficit. He could lead his team to do great things. So he never, ever got rattled. You know, even when he missed shots, it wasn't because he was rattled. It was because you can't make them all but he understood what calm under pressure meant. And again, it's, it's just a critical piece in a, our day-to-day -day activities. Because we're all going to have those last minute requests. We're all gonna have those high pressure demands. We're all gonna have that attorney that comes to us and says, I need this tomorrow and 10 point font on this page and 12 point font on this page and I want this color scheme on the graph and this is gonna be the most ridiculous request you've ever gotten in your entire life. And you could, you could shut down, you could freak out. You could panic, but what good is that gonna do you? How is that gonna help you accomplish anything? It's not. 
Stay calm. Understand that there's always a way. My, my sons will get sicker and sicker of this by, by the older they get, but I always say there's a way. Figure it out. Let's figure out how we do this. And resolving conflict. As a leader, this is critical. Because how many times has a conflict arisen? Work, personal, societal? Somebody else will fix it, right? It'll, it'll, it'll fix itself. There was a guy, and you kind of love these as speakers when something actually happens on the way to your presentation. There was a guy on the flight that people were getting on and the baggage, the overhead baggage was getting full, which Southwest, if you're listening, get bigger baggage over top because everybody's carrying on now. This woman came on, there was no place to put her back. There was a gentleman who had a backpack about this size <laughs> in the overhead bin. Nothing by his feet, because I looked. And he had a hat, like a baseball cap, golf hat, tied to his backpack. The flight attendant asked him, said very nicely, sir, would you mind moving your bag down below your feet? And please, let's, you know, this, this woman's gonna have to check her bag to her final destination if she can't get it up in the thing. He said no. Right? So I checked my bag because I wanted her to have a space. I took my bag out of the overhead bin. I resolved a conflict. Now, I'm not a hero. I'm just a nice person, right? I, I saw a, con a conflict position. I saw somebody who was going to be put in a position that they didn't want to be in. It was more convenient for me to check my bag to Chicago than it was for her to check it to her final destination. She needed it. But it was because the jackass and 34A didn't want to move his golf bag and his hat, or his little, his little you know, Hello Kitty backpack, or whatever that thing was. <laughs> but it's the ability to understand that sometimes it is, your, it is your place to step up and resolve that conflict. It is your place to speak up. It is your place to defend somebody, personal or professional. It's okay to be that person. You may see the solution, but if you stay silent, you're complicit to the problem. Personal, professional, societal. If you have a solution, you are complicit if you stay silent. Benefits of a high EQ. What's in it for me, right? So here's all this warm, fuzzy stuff and lots of conversations about wine and jerks on planes. What's in it for me? 90% of top performers have a high EQ. And I'll get into some of this later on, but even if you take that test today, Let's say you score in the, it's on a 100% scale. So if you're in the high 70s, mid 70s, you've got some work to do, right? The benefit is that you can actually do things to improve your own emotional intelligence. So if you don't have it today, it's like exercise or uh, learning a new trade or learning a new instrument. You can practice your emotional intelligence and get better at it. So you want to be in that top 90%. If you want to be a top performer, you can be smart all day long. But if you don't have a good EQ to balance out that intelligence, if you don't have the relatability to individuals to be able to lead and communicate with them, you're gonna fall short of what we would consider a top performer. You may be real fantastic, but you're not hitting your optimum performance. So high EQ will get you into that position. Emotional intelligence will contribute up to 58% of a positive performance. Again, you may be great at, at financial statistics. You may be great at finding a story in the data. You may be wonderful at all the IQ tactical things. But your actual performance is how you communicate it, how you deliver it, how you interact with other people that are going to be impacted by this data. That is so critical, so, so critical. Because again, we don't operate in bubbles. We're not all one man and one woman shops. We have to work with other people. We have to interact with other people. And so 58% of your performance is based on how you do that, how you communicate, how you check your emotions. For those that, that maybe don't work in a firm but work on a, on a separate company, think about any client request, right? Any client that comes to you and says, I need this. I don't care what's going on in your life. Your clients are your lifeblood of your company, of your firm. You've gotta do what you need to do. If you can't check your emotions, if you can't put your needs and emotions aside for a little bit and understand that that needs to be taken care of for your client, you're not gonna be a high performer. It's just, it's science, right? Here's all my math right here, my 58% and my 90%. Like this is about as mathy as I get. <laughs> this is the big one. 
Statistics have been shown. There is research to prove this, or I would not legally be able to put this on a slide. People with high emotional intelligence have tracked upwards of $29,000 a year more than average performers in the same role. They have a better trajectory on leadership positions. They have better buy-in from management. They, ha they are on a better path. Again, I've been in the situation in my past where I'm doing just as good of a job as somebody else. But prior to, prior to my emotional intelligence wake-up call, I was frustrated because I was like, I'm doing a better job than this person. I'm putting out better quality material. I don't understand why this person is being looked at for a promotion and I'm not. That, that revelation in itself is poor EQ. I, I, wasn't, I, I wasn't in control of my emotions. I wasn't, I wasn't checking and finding those opportunities to improve. I was so worried about my own ego that I wasn't getting past the fact that, oh, maybe they're a better communicator. Maybe they have better relationships than I do. Maybe they're, you know, some people call it playing the game. I call it just being nice to everybody. What's wrong with that? It's, it's in those instances that you find that new trajectory. You may be stuck, you may be frustrated, you may be thinking, I, you know, I'm destined for this great leadership role. I'm meant to be a director. I'm meant to be a managing partner. I'm meant to be a CMO or a CFO. But if you're not looking on the inside, if you're not figuring out those different soft skills that you can flex and get better at, you're gonna be stuck for a while. Because the likelihood, if you put two people together, and they are putting out the same quality of tactical hard work, right? If you pretend you're the one making the management decision, you're the one making the hiring decision to promote somebody from a, from a legal project management individual to a CFO. You've got two people. This person's phenomenal, knocks the numbers out, reads the data better than anybody else, can find the hidden gems of information. But <laughs> sucks to talk to. I'm not trying to be coy and, and silly by it, but really, you know, I mean, there are people that are really good at what they do that just cannot communicate to save their life. Or if somebody who does the exact same stuff from a tactical standpoint, but manages cross-team relationships, doesn't panic under pressure, understands the need of the clients, internal and external, who do you think is going to get that nod, right? This was me at one point. I've always kind of been not fun to talk to, but... You know, I had some things I needed to work on from a leadership standpoint. But this person was getting the nod for the promotion. And I couldn't, couldn't bridge that. And now I get it. Now I understand that once you exercise all of these skills, you're going to be put in that position to accelerate your career a lot quicker and a lot more effectively. So how do you do that? Take the test today. You're in your low 70s, mid 70s, high 70s. Low 40s, not judging. We all have a starting point. How do you increase it? How do you flex those things? How do you practice those things? This is, this is something anybody can do, anybody. This room, any room, any city, any world, any country, any world. People on Mars can flex their emotional intelligence yeah. all day long and be fantastic at it. But these are tips that you can use to increase your emotional intelligence. Be aware of your emotions. How simple is that? Don't just take things for at face value. If something, the next time something angers you, the next time something makes you sad, don't just take it at what it is. Think about the triggers within that communication. Maybe it's somebody, like I talked about earlier, maybe it's somebody that talked to you and talked to you in a way that was condescending. And it's not necessarily that they talked to you in a condescending way, which is not good anyway, but maybe it's related to something else. Maybe it's a, a former coach or a parent or a teacher that, that condescended you because of fill in the blank reason, but you're holding on to that. If you're not aware of that and you're not able to, to use that emotion for your benefit, you're, gonna, you're not gonna be able to progress. So understand that every time you feel an emotion, understand even happiness, and I talk a lot about the negative emotions, but even when you get happy, why are you happy? Why do you enjoy it, right? Why do I enjoy speaking? It makes me happy because I love talking with people and helping people become their best selves and become better effective leaders, be, become better effective people. That makes me happy and that's why. Identifying triggers, this is huge. Huge, huge, huge. Because again, we all have them. Positive and negative, things, things that trigger you. you. You play James Brown and I'm in the best mood ever because James Brown is a positive trigger for me. I have a James Brown playlist on my iPod for the drives in and the drives out because I want to be in a good mood. 
James Brown and Otis Redding all day long. But identify the triggers that set you off. Think about, think about the days that you roll in a little bit late. You can't catch up. You're, you're, you're trying all day long. You feel like you're climbing, climbing up a mountain of quicksand. You can't get ahead. What was that initial trigger? You were late. Maybe you're a scheduled person. So being late, make, or being late sets you off. Maybe it's the way somebody talks to you. One of the biggest things that, is, is that we, don't, we don't do as a society, but we should do more often, is telling people how they should talk to us. When was the last time somebody talked to you in a very condescending way and you just kind of dealt with it, right? But if you say, excuse me, I, I don't think you should talk to me like that, right? Of course, we think about like the three worst attorneys in our firm are like, oh, I'm not saying that to them. I've done that. Not at my current firm, but at a former firm. And it worked because we're all human. We all want to be respected. We all want to be heard, right? I'm not going to say I didn't about pass out when I did it because there's that, there's that purgatory of decision, right? Because you're like, oh, God, how are they going to react? And he was okay with it. He understood. But again, low emotional intelligence. He was delivering something on me that wasn't mine. So identify those triggers. Write them down. Next time you get angry, write down what happened. Write down what set you off. If you can avoid those things, if you can manage those things, if you can manage communication, if you can go to somebody later on and say, hey, look, you know, maybe it's somebody on your team. You say, hey, look, you know, I, I'd really like to talk about that last meeting. You said this. I took it this way. This is what I heard you say. Can we discuss this? Because if you let it go, how's it going to get better? How are they going to learn to communicate with you? How are they going to learn to be effective with you? Set time for problem solving, another one I'm huge on. How many times have you been in those days where it's back to 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 back? 5.30 rolls around, you're like, what did I get done? Nothing. You didn't solve any problems, you sat in meetings all day long, nothing got accomplished. Set time, block your time. I'm a huge believer in time blocking, huge. I hate hour long meetings, I like 45 minute meetings. Why, it gives me 15 minutes to transition. If I can intentionally block time, if I know that I've got a packed day, if one day's starting to fill up, I block 30 minutes on purpose because I need that time to take notes, figure out my, my next to-dos, get them on my whiteboard, and then I can go to my next meeting and be effective. Because otherwise, it's just a cascade. It's just a snowball rolling downhill, right? Set time for problem solving. Figure out those times that you can actually get after the things you need to get after as opposed to just letting the tide sweep you away. Observing body language. Do this in, airports are the best place in the world to do this. For those of you that are not here in Chicago, when you leave to fly back, watch body language. Watch people getting on and off planes. Watch, think about the last time, has anybody ever flown to Vegas? What's the body language of people getting on the flight to Vegas? Happy, right? You're playing games, people are partying. It's, it is a party. Any flight going to Las Vegas is a party. How about the flights coming back from Vegas? <laughs> right? Different, different feel to it, right? You could drop a pin because it's a different, different body language. It's a different tone. Same thing. Next time you're in a meeting, don't, don't like stare at everybody, but glance around. Look at people's body language. Watch for transitions. Use your peripheral and watch, watch for transitions. You've got 10 people in a meeting. Somebody says something, somebody sh shows a, a PowerPoint, or somebody goes over some data, somebody does this. Somebody picks up their phone. What happened? Checked out. Don't care. Don't agree. But watch that body language. Engage that individual afterwards. Not right then, like, why'd you pick up your phone? That would be fun, right? Not awkward at all. What are you looking at, huh? What are you looking at? There's a, there's a presentation going out. What are you looking at, huh? But make sure that you engage. Find out what. What was it about that? What does that do? You observe body language, which exercises your emotional intelligence, and you open up a line of communication. You're being a leader. You're understanding what the, what the disconnect was. Because that person's probably not going to be engaged when it happens. Because why? Because it's awkward. Find that person, seek them out, have a conversation with them. Explain your decision making. As a, as a happily married man, this is a huge one for me. Explain your decisions. There's nothing worse, and I was guilty of this not too long ago, and I learned this really quickly. I got into some data, I got into some things, and I, I got really excited, but I spent three months in the data. I was looking at this almost every day. I was spending hours and hours and hours and hours on this data, and then I went to present it to my attorneys, and I was like, this is great, isn't it? And they looked at it for the first time, and they went, what is this? I didn't understand, I didn't explain all my decisions. I didn't explain why I went this route. I didn't explain what it meant. I didn't explain all these things. I didn't get into the notes of it because I was too excited about it. Had I backed up and said, this is why I decided to create this 
breakdown. This is why I think it's going to be effective, and this is what I think you're going to be able to do with it. Much better presentation, right? I'm laying it all out. I'm explaining my decisions. But me, me being like the, the squirrel that sees a new shiny thing, I'm like, this is phenomenal. Horribly ineffective meeting. Horribly ineffective. I learned from it, though. Didn't fail. Taking feedback more positively. The one thing I know that some people have, have been through uh, 360 evaluations. You go through disk evaluations, things like that, right? The best thing in the entire world, and it is the most humbling thing in the entire world, find five people that you know and you trust, personal and professional, and ask them and say, look, I literally, and sign a contract if you have to. I've, I've heard it being done this way. Like, I'm signing a contract that says I will hold nothing against you for whatever you say in the next hour. But I want to know exactly what you think of me, my performance, my communication skills, my ability to relate, my emotional intelligence, my ability to, to check my emotions, tell me everything. You would be fascinated to hear what other people think. Fascinated. Again, opportunities for improvement. Um, a, quick, a quick aside that I'm, I'm, I would love to try this. I don't know if it's going to work at my firm, but I'm gonna, I would love to try this. I heard a presentation two weeks ago uh, from an individual who was a director of strategy at a, a branding agency. And they did what they called a reverse focus group. They took, normally when you do a focus group, if anybody's been in a focus group, you sit and you try the product and give your feedback and whatever, right? And then there's a group of people behind a two-way mirror because that's not creepy. And they're from the agency and the company and they listen to your feedback, right? And I applied this, she didn't do it with a law firm, but I applied it to a law firm scenario. They flipped the script. They took the consumers, put them behind the glass, gave them beer, wine, food, and let the company talk about their product out loud. And the customers said, oh, uh, yeah, I, I kind of agree with that. I kind of see what they're where they're going with that, or I don't agree with that at all. I don't think this product does that at all. I don't get that benefit. <laughs> Imagine a room full of attorneys talking about their practice and their clients behind the glass, yep. <laughs> right? If I pull that off, I will go down in history as the best legal marketer of all time, right? <laughs> open door accessibility. How many times have you heard of somebody who says, oh, I have an open door policy, and you go to find them, you can't find them anywhere. Your door is open because you're never there. Right? I'm accessible, but my calendar is blocked. Can't make time. If you want to be effective, be truly open door. Be, effective, be accessible and be an effective communicator. Let people know when they can find you. Nothing wrong with that. Even if it's something you put up, a, if you've got an office and you put up a sign on the front of your office that says, here's when I'm available today. You're being available. You're making yourself stronger on emotional intelligence because you're, you're managing your relationships better. Because there's nothing worse than having a leader or somebody that, that you report to say, oh yeah, open door policy, right? The great, the great wooing of, of recruiting. Yeah, we want you to come work for us because we have an open door policy. You get here, nowhere to be found, right? Be that person that, that exercises that effectively. Make sure that you are being truly open door, making sure that you're being accessible to those people that need you. If you can't do it right there, if somebody comes to you and they, you can't do it right there, there's nothing wrong with saying, I can't right now, I'm free at 2.30, can we do it then? I'll block the time. How does that make you feel? If anybody, if any of you came to me and said, hey, I have a question for you, and I said, eh, I can't right now, but call me in 30 minutes, my time is yours, right? You've taken disappointment and opened an opportunity for a relationship, okay? It's not just, eh, I can't right now, or eh, get to back to me some other time, call me in 30 minutes, that time is yours. So let's talk about what did we learn? Did you learn what emotional intelligence is? Okay. Did you learn about some daily benefits? Some things that you can do on a daily basis to, to exercise and observe emotional intelligence in action or lack thereof? And besides the $29,000 that you're all going to go back and negotiate now, <laughs> once you have emotional intelligence, right? Once you have better emotional intelligence, go back and negotiate that. This guy said, yeah. So things that you can do to benefit your career. Become better leaders, become effective communicators, be better teammates but really how to maximize your opportunities for your career path. Emotional intelligence is the quickest, easiest way to get there. Drink a, drink, a, drink a humble punch and get after it because I truly, truly understand the value of it because I've lived it. I was not the best at it. Now I'm a lot better. I'm not perfect at it, but I'm a lot better. And I've seen a tremendous change in my career and my daily life. So I empower you all 
to do that. I empower you all to be humble, to change the course, to become happier, better people through emotional intelligence. And while you're at it, because I can take constructive feedback. If you want to make sure that you rate this, this presentation on the app, we would greatly appreciate it. So uh, take a few minutes and just uh, give us your thoughts, give us your ratings. I really, really appreciate it. And I appreciate all of you being here today. I really appreciate you taking the time to sit and, and listen to me talk about this. And I hope that you, you go forward and understand the power of emotional intelligence. Thank you. Have a great day. <laughs>